All right, welcome back. Um, we're in the um, afternoon session uh, for our last two uh, topics of the day, Ebola virus and hepatitis B, hepatitis virus. Um, so we'll begin with um, Ebola virus with um, Dr. Fry giving the uh, introduction. Uh, Dr. Fry, are you ready? Yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Romero. Thank you. The next the next presentation will be given. Uh, the next presentations will be given by the Ebola virus vaccine work group. Next slide, please. I would like to start our presentations by uh, recognizing and thanking all the Ebola working group members. Uh, this includes the ACIP members, and Dr. Beth Bo uh, Bell is our other ACIP member who works on this group. Um, I also want to recognize uh, Mary Choi. Dr. Choi is our CDC lead who has done a great job keeping the committee on task. Um, the ex officio members are listed for us. The liaison representatives are also listed as well as consultants. I do want to point out that Robert Atmar was a recent working group member and is now working as a consultant. Next slide, please. Our great consultants and CDC contributors are listed here also. Thanks to everyone. Next slide, please. We'll give you a quick recap of what's been happening with the Ebola virus vaccine um, since um, February, uh, well, for this session and then since uh, we met with you last. Recently, the ACIP recommended uh, pre exposure vaccination with. Or Vivo for adults aged 18 years of age and older in the U.S. population who are at highest risk for potential occupational exposure for to Ebola virus species Zaire Ebola virus uh, for the following reasons: they are responding to an outbreak of Ebola virus disease or EVD, or they work as healthcare personnel at federally designated Ebola treatment centers in the United States or work as laboratorians or other safe or other staff at biosafety level four facilities in the United States. Uh, and just as a reminder, the Ervivo vaccine is a replication competent vaccine which was uh, which uses recombinant vesicular stomatitis virus to express the glycoprotein of Ebola virus species Ebola Zaire. Next slide please. The key events that have occurred uh, since February 2020 are also listed here. And these are the 10th EVD outbreak or Ebola virus disease outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo ended on June 28, 2020. There were 3,400 plus cases and about 66% of these cases resulted in death. The 11th EVD outbreak in the DRC was declared on June 1st, 2020 and ended on November 18th, 2020. Although this outbreak was much smaller, the mortality rate was again approximately 42%, which is quite high. On October 14th, 2020, the FDA approved Imazeb for the treatment of EVD caused by species Zaire Ebola virus in adult and pediatric patients. And next slide, please. By December 21st, uh, 2020, the US FDA approved Ebanga, which is a monoclonal antibody for the treatment for species Zaire Ebola virus infection in adults and children. And shortly thereafter, on January the 7th, 2021, use of the Ebola vaccine recommendations of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices was published in MMWR recommendations and reports. A month later, another EVD outbreak was reported in North Kivu province in DRC and a week later, another uh, outbreak began in Guinea. Next slide, please. The working group has identified two additional U.S. populations at risk for uh, potential occupational 
exposure to Ebola virus for whom potential policy options are under consideration. These include healthcare personnel at a designated Ebola treatment centers involved in the care and transport of confirmed EBD patients, and also individuals who work as laboratorians and support staff at laboratory research networks or LRN facilities that handle replication competent Ebola virus. Next slide. Our agenda today uh, is the following. A presentation will be given by Dr. Allison Joyce on the survey of healthcare workers at state designated Ebola treatment centers and laboratory research network facilities. And the presentation will be given by Dr. Caitlin Kossaboom, Kossaboom on the working group discussions regarding expansion of recommendations to state designated bullet treatment centers and again, laboratory research networks. Next slide, please. I put this uh, healthcare personnel definition up here just to remind people, uh, please go ahead and take a quick glance at that. But um, healthcare personnel refers to all paid and unpaid persons serving in healthcare settings who have the potential for direct or indirect exposure to patients or infectious materials. Uh, this uh, can include uh, all the usual healthcare workers that people would normally think of, but also contractual staff not employed by the healthcare facility uh, and persons not directly in, uh, involved <clears throat> in patient care, such as clerical, dietary, environmental, laundry, uh, administrative billing, and so forth. Next slide, please. Thank you. That's the end of this presentation. Thank you, Dr. Romero. Thank you, Dr. Fry. Thank you. So um, let's uh, turn this over to uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Joyce uh, for a presentation on background on state-designated uh, Ebola treatment centers, ETCs, and laboratory response network, LRN uh, facilities, and survey results. Uh, Ms. Joyce. Thank you. Good afternoon. I will be presenting the results of the vaccine acceptability survey that was distributed among our two populations of interest, healthcare personnel at state designated Ebola treatment centers and individuals who work at laboratory response network facilities with Ebola testing capability. Before their work group could begin discussing the consideration to expand eligibility for Ebola vaccine in these two populations, they requested more information about them, and especially their interest in and acceptability of the Ebola vaccine. Therefore, we created a vaccine acceptability survey and distributed it to the populations of interest. When we distributed the survey, we provided excerpts from the package insert to help inform the survey respondents. We summarized the available information on clinical efficacy, duration of protection, and potential adverse reactions of the vaccine. We reported that across various blinded placebo-controlled studies, arthralgia was seen in 3 to 40% of vaccine recipients, was generally mild to moderate in intensity, and resolved within one week. Arthritis was seen in 0 to 24% of vaccine recipients, mostly of mild to moderate intensity, and resolved within several weeks. One study reported severe arthritis, defined as preventing daily activity in 12% of vaccinated persons. We also provided information on potential transmission of the vaccine virus, reporting that vaccine virus RNA was detected in urine or saliva of some vaccinated individuals at time points so, ranging from day one to Allison? day 14. Allison, yeah. so, excuse me for interrupting, but can you just please tell us when to advance the slides? Oh yes, I will, I'm getting to that. Oh, you're still not on the second slide? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, vaccine virus transmission was detected in time points ranging from day one to day 14 post-vaccination. Following this background information, we asked survey respondents about their perceived risk of infection with Zaire Ebola virus, their interest in receiving the Ebola vaccine, and potential concerns they had about the vaccine. Next slide, please.
before we dive into the survey results, I'd like to share some background on what a state-designated Ebola treatment center is and how it differs from a federally designated Ebola treatment center, whose personnel received approval for pre-exposure vaccination in the February 2020 ACIP meeting. Both of these institutions are hospitals that are specially trained and equipped to manage the care of a suspect Ebola virus disease patient for the duration of their illness. There are currently 11 federally designated Ebola treatment centers, or ETCs, in the United States, as depicted on this map. These facilities receive funding directly from the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, with the exception of NIH. They have a formal agreement with the federal government to provide treatment for a suspect special pathogen patient, and federally designated ETCs have a designated HHS region that they are responsible for. So, for example, Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles would provide treatment for an EBD patient from California, Nevada, Arizona, or Hawaii. Next slide. So how is this different from a state-designated Ebola treatment center? Well, first, there are considerably more state-designated ETCs in the United States. We were not able to find an official list, but we reached out to all 50 states and compiled a list of 51 hospitals that identify as state-designated ETCs. Additionally, these facilities do not receive federal funding. Essentially, these hospitals volunteer to become an ETC and approval is granted by state and local authorities. The hospitals can also decide to no longer be an ETC, which could give them a greater attrition potential as compared to federally designated ETCs. There is also a question of whether or not a state designated ETC would transfer a suspect Ebola patient to a federally designated ETC. During preliminary discussions with a handful of state ETCs, four mentioned they do not currently have a plan to transfer a suspect Ebola patient should one present to their facility. But of course, this is subject to change. Based off interviews with five of these hospitals, it was estimated that each ETC has a staff of 100 to 150 healthcare personnel. Thus, a potential recommendation for this population could involve between 5,000 to 7,500 healthcare personnel. Next slide, please. After identifying the list of 51 state-designated ETCs, we sent an invitation to participate in the vaccine acceptability survey to 49. We did not have point of contact information for two facilities. We received 364 total survey responses. However, 66 of them were incomplete and therefore excluded leaving a total of 298 responses, including in the data analysis and this presentation. Next slide, please. The survey population was fairly evenly split between the ages above and below 40, with 52% above 40. However, women were more likely to respond to the survey and made up 69% of our survey respondents. Next slide. Looking at the professional groups of this population, nurses and doctors made up the majority of the survey respondents, with 39% of the survey population self-identifying as nurses and 22% as doctors. We had lower response rates from other professional groups, including respiratory therapists, EMTs, advanced practice providers, including nurse practitioners and physician assistants, laboratory technicians, managers, and environmental services staff. Next slide. We first asked survey respondents if they were eligible for vaccination and offered the Ebola vaccine today, would they choose to be vaccinated? And 54% of this survey population expressed interest in receiving the vaccine. It is important to provide context as to when the survey respondents answered this question. Today refers to the time between October 14th through January 22nd, 2021, when the survey was available to this population. And during this time, the Ebola outbreak in Ecuador province, DRC, was declared over on November 18th. Next slide. We also gave survey respondents an option to choose when to get vaccinated, and 23% said immediately, 
25% said when an Ebola case was imported to the U.S., and 33% said when an Ebola case was imported to their state in the U.S. 19% would not choose to be vaccinated. Next slide. Uh, thus, when we broke down the question of choosing to receive the Ebola vaccine and gave respondents the option of choosing when to receive it, the interest in vaccine rose from 54% to 81%. Uh, please click twice. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you. We also gave survey respondents the opportunity to provide free text responses, explaining why they would choose not to be vaccinated. The most common responses were their perceived low risk of exposure and concerns about vaccine safety and potential long-term effects. Next slide. These two bar graphs show the interest in vaccine by age and sex with the blue bar representing those who expressed an interest in receiving the Ebola vaccine, and the orange bar representing those who reported they were not interested in receiving the vaccine. Looking at age first, those who were between 18 to 40 were slightly more likely to say they were interested in receiving the vaccine, with 57% being interested. For those aged 40 or above, there wasn't that much of a difference. Next, looking at sex, women were split evenly with 50% expressing interest in the vaccine, while men were considerably more likely to be interested in the vaccine, with 63% reporting interest. Uh, however, I would like to reemphasize that a smaller total number of men responded to the survey, so it is possible that this result could be due to a smaller sample size. Next slide. There does not appear to be a clear pattern looking at interest in vaccine by profession. It does not appear that closer patient contact results in higher vaccine interest, as doctors, nurses, EMTs, and laboratory technicians were all more likely to be interested in the vaccine than not, while advanced practice providers, including nurse practitioners and physician's assistants and respiratory therapists, who also have close patient contact were less likely to be interested in the vaccine. Environmental services staff were also less likely to be interested in the vaccine, but this group was so small at only three people that this isn't really an interpretable result. Next slide. We asked survey respondents about their perceived severity of Ebola virus disease and risk of infection. 89% of survey respondents said that they considered Ebola virus disease to be a very serious disease, while two individuals responded that it was not serious. When asked about their perceived risk of infection, if an Ebola virus disease patient were admitted to their hospital, 48% of the survey respondents rated their risk of infection as low. Next slide. Looking at interest in vaccine by perceived severity of disease, we can see that people who reported Ebola virus disease to be very serious were more likely to be interested in the vaccine compared to people who reported Ebola virus disease to be serious. The two individuals who reported Ebola virus disease to not be serious both indicated interest in receiving the vaccine. So it is possible that there was an error in their response. Looking at interest in vaccine by perceived risk of infection, those who thought their risk of infection was high or intermediate were more likely to be interested in receiving the vaccine, while those who thought their risk was low or next to zero were less likely. Next slide. We provided a list of potential reasons for not being interested in the vaccine and asked survey respondents to select all that applied to them. 55% expressed a concern that the risks of the vaccine outweighed the benefits, and 42% were concerned about transmitting the vaccine virus to family and friends. Next slide. When asked about which adverse reaction they were most concerned about, potential for a serious adverse event was the top concern for 32% and transmission of the vaccine virus to close contacts or patients was the top concern for 26%. Next 
23% were most concerned about the potential increased risk of arthritis. Next slide. When asked what additional information would be most important to them, 66% expressed an interest in knowing more about the likelihood and nature of adverse events. 56% wanted to know more about the likelihood and severity of transmitting the vaccine virus. And 50% were curious if infectious disease experts and their peers were being vaccinated. Next slide. We also asked survey respondents if they thought ACIP should vote to recommend the Ebola vaccine to healthcare personnel at state-designated Ebola treatment centers. Please note that the option of shared clinical decision-making was not included in this question. 53% thought ACIP should recommend, 9% thought ACIP should not recommend, and 38% were unsure. Next slide. We provided the opportunity for survey respondents to explain their choice in free text. The most common reasoning for those who thought ACIP should recommend was that people should have the right to decide for themselves. We should be prepared and the extra safety is worth it. Next slide. For those who thought ACIP should not recommend, People's reasoning was that PPE is sufficient to protect against Ebola virus disease, the risk of exposure is so low, and there would be time to offer the vaccine if the situation in the United States changes. Next slide. For those who were unsure whether or not ACIP should recommend, they felt they needed more information on the vaccine, or they weren't sure the benefits outweighed the risks. Next slide. This concludes the results of the vaccine acceptability survey of the Ebola vaccine among healthcare personnel at state-designated Ebola treatment centers. In summary, 54% of this population expressed an interest in receiving the vaccine today, which increased to 81% when people were given the choice to get vaccinated at a later time. Concern for a serious adverse event and transmission of the vaccine virus to others were top concerns among this study population. Next slide. I will now present the results of the vaccine acceptability survey for the laboratory response network population. I will try to move through this next presentation quickly as the structure of the survey is the same as the one that was distributed to the state designated Ebola treatment centers. First, I would like to extend a thank you to Julie Villanueva and Tricia Aiden, as they were the ones who distributed the survey to the laboratory response network facilities with Ebola testing capability. Next slide. So what is the laboratory response network? As the name implies, it's a large network of laboratories that aim to quickly respond to biological and chemical threats and other public health emergencies. The Laboratory Response Network for Biological Threats Preparedness has three tiers, as depicted in the pyramid. First, there are thousands of Sentinel laboratories. These are largely in hospitals and local public health facilities and perform rule-out testing. Second, there are roughly 130 reference laboratories. These are largely found in state health departments and at various military, veterinary, agricultural, and water testing facilities. And they can do additional testing. Finally, there are three national laboratories, CDC, USAMARID, and the Naval Medical Research Center. Within the LRN, 62 facilities have Ebola virus testing capacity. We estimate that 10 to 15 laboratorians per facility would be capable of performing the tests on a suspect Ebola virus sample. Thus, a potential recommendation for this population could involve an estimated 620 to 930 individuals. Next slide. Based on the numbers previously shared, there are roughly 1,133 facilities within the LRN for biological threats preparedness. 
We sent an invitation to participate in the survey to 62 of these facilities, as these were the ones with capacity for Ebola testing. We received 96 total survey responses. However, 26 of them were incomplete, leaving 70 responses included in the data analysis and this presentation. Next slide. 76% of this survey population was 40 or above, and 64% were female. Next slide. When asked about profession, survey respondents were given the options of laboratory scientist, clerk or receptionist, environmental services, manager, or other. 64% self-identified as laboratory scientist, 30% as manager, and four individuals self-identified as other. And all four described themselves as director or laboratory director. Next slide. 59% expressed an interest in receiving the vaccine when asked if they were eligible and offered the vaccine today. The survey for this population was available from December 29th, 2020 till January 21st, 2021, when there were no active Ebola outbreaks in the world. Next slide. When providing the option of choosing when to get vaccinated, 34% said immediately, 29% said when an Ebola case was imported to the U.S., and 23% said when an Ebola case was imported to their state in the U.S., and 14% would not choose to be vaccinated. Next slide. Uh, click again, please. Thus, when we broke down the question of choosing to receive the Ebola vaccine and gave respondents the option of choosing when to receive it, the interest in vaccine rose from 59% to 86%. Next slide. When given the opportunity to provide free text responses to explain their reasoning for choosing not to be vaccinated, the most common responses were their low risk of exposure and concerns about potential side effects. This population of the laboratory response network was especially concerned about the increased risk of arthritis. Next slide. Looking at interest in vaccine by age and sex, people between the age of 18 to 40 and men were considerably more likely to say that they were interested in receiving the vaccine than not. Next slide. 64% of laboratory scientists expressed interest in receiving the vaccine, compared to 52% of managers, which could be explained by laboratory scientists having closer contact with a potential Ebola virus sample than managers. And only one of the four laboratory directors expressed interest in receiving the vaccine. Next slide. 96% of survey respondents classified Ebola virus disease as a very serious disease, and 59% thought that their perceived risk of infection was low, even if an Ebola virus sample was sent to their facility for testing. Next slide. Interest in vaccine by perceived severity of disease was interesting. 58% of those who considered Ebola virus disease to be very serious were interested in the vaccine, compared to 67% who considered Ebola virus disease to be serious. Interest in vaccine by perceived risk of infection follows the trend that one would expect, with the higher the perceived risk of infection, the more interest expressed in receiving the vaccine. Next slide. When asked about some possible reasons for choosing not to be vaccinated, 51% of the LRN survey population said the risks of the vaccine outweigh the benefits, and 38% were concerned about transmitting the vaccine virus to family or friends. Next slide. Potential increased risk of arthritis was a top concern among the LRN population and this is different than what was seen in the Ebola treatment center population. Next slide. 
However, the LRN population was also interested in receiving additional information on the likelihood and nature of adverse events from vaccination, as well as the likelihood and severity of transmitting the vaccine virus to others. Next slide. When asked if ACIP should vote to recommend the Ebola vaccine to staff at LRN facilities, again, not providing the option of shared clinical decision-making, 59% said yes. Next slide. The most commonly provided reasons for why ACIP should recommend were that it provided an added layer of protection against a laboratory-acquired infection, and the LRN population as a whole is at increased risk of exposure to Zaire Ebola virus, with one person stating it is very likely that LRN personnel will be handling Ebola samples for diagnostic purposes. Next slide. For the six individuals who felt ACIP should not recommend, all listed the low risk of exposure as their reason. Next slide. For people who were not sure whether or not ACIP should recommend, the reasons provided were needing more information on the risk of exposure versus the risks of side effects, and some felt the LRN was not a high-risk group and priority should be given to first responders. Next slide. That concludes the results of the Vaccine Acceptability Survey of the Ebola vaccine among workers at laboratory response network facilities with Ebola testing capacity. In summary, 59% of this study population expressed an interest in receiving the vaccine today, which increased to 86% when people were given the choice to get vaccinated at a later time. Common reasons for not wanting to receive the vaccine were low risk of exposure and concerns about potential side effects, especially arthritis, which was different from the top concerns of the state-designated ETC population. Next slide. I thank you all very much. Uh, that concludes the presentations of the vaccine acceptability survey results among our two populations of interest. Thank you for that presentation, um, Ms. Joyce. Are there any questions from the voting members or the liaisons? Dr. Paling. Um, thank you very much for this presentation. It was very helpful to hear. Um, my question for you is um, for the 51 state designated Ebola treatment centers, you have 298 responses. Do you know um, how many of the 49 um, uh, state designated Ebola treatment centers are represented um, of those you had contacts? And then the same question would be for the laboratory response network. Yes. So for the state designated Ebola treatment centers, we know that we heard back from 18 of the 49 ETCs. Uh, when we first distributed the survey, we asked for them to respond to the email. And then once they responded, we sent them the link to the survey. Uh, but upon additional attempts at data collection, we just distributed the link to the survey. So it is possible that more than 18 of the facilities responded, but we know that at least 18 did. And then for the LRN facilities, unfortunately, I can't speak to how many out of the 62 responded. Uh, it was just a broad email invitation sent to all 62 facilities. Are there any other questions or comments uh, for Ms. Joyce? I see none. Thank you very much. Um, we'll move on to our next presentation, uh, which is the uh, review of preliminary work group discussions by Dr. Kosa uh, Boom. Excuse me. Thank you, Dr. Romero, and hello, everyone. My name is Caitlin Kosaboom, and I'll be presenting today on the ACIP Ebola vaccine work group's discussions of the proposed recommendation text for the policy options currently under consideration. Next slide. 
As my colleague Allison Joyce discussed in her previous presentation, the ACIP Ebola Vaccine Workgroup has identified two additional U.S. populations at risk for potential occupational exposure to Ebola virus for whom potential policy options are under consideration. Healthcare personnel of state-designated Ebola treatment centers who may be involved in the care and transport of suspect and confirmed Ebola patients, and individuals who work as laboratorians and support staff at Laboratory Response Network, or LRN, facilities that may receive, process, and perform diagnostic testing on clinical samples from suspect Ebola patients. We would like to discuss the following policy issue with the committee today. Should pre-exposure vaccination with the RVSV Ebola vaccine be recommended for adults 18 years and older in these two populations? Next slide. I'll begin by giving you an overview of the conversations that have been had by the work group to this point. Please note that these work group discussions are preliminary and we're looking forward to the committee's feedback today. The first section of my presentation will focus on the work group considerations for the expansion of the Ebola vaccine recommendations to healthcare personnel working in state designated Ebola treatment centers in the United States. Next slide. The work group has discussed two policy options with regards to recommending the Ebola vaccine in healthcare personnel at state designated ETCs. Recommend and recommend with shared clinical decision making. Considerations are ongoing, but preliminary discussions suggest that the work group favors shared clinical decision making with regards to pre exposure vaccination with the Ebola vaccine in this population. We are looking forward to receiving feedback today from the committee on this issue. Next slide. Now I'll summarize the themes behind the discussions of the work group members who favor recommending vaccination in this population. These members believe that there's a comparable level of risk to healthcare personnel in state designated versus federal Ebola treatment centers for which there was a recommendation issued by ACIP in February of 2020. They believe it's important to provide healthcare providers at state designated Ebola treatment centers the same protection as their federally designated counterparts. Additionally, healthcare personnel at state designated Ebola treatment centers may have a higher risk of being exposed to an Ebola patient without prior notification because there are a higher number of state designated ETCs at 51 facilities compared to the 11 federally designated facilities. And these federally designated facilities are more likely to receive Ebola patients transferred to them, which gives them the advance notice to prepare. Additionally, these work group members had concerns that a shared clinical decision-making recommendation would essentially pass the responsibility to employees and or healthcare providers when the individual level of risk within this population is very difficult to assess. Next slide. Additionally, these work group members discussed that recommending the vaccine for this population would improve general preparedness of frontline healthcare personnel for the following reasons. The side effects of the vaccine do not make it amenable for a just-in-time vaccination strategy after an imported case is identified in a facility because, for example, the expected reactogenicity would be difficult to differentiate from symptoms of Ebola virus disease in a post-exposure scenario. It's also difficult retrospectively to identify the movements of potentially infectious materials and who may have been exposed. By recommending the vaccination, the same prevention tools are offered to all personnel that may have a potential exposure. Finally, a recommendation would encourage state designated management teams to be better prepared by evaluating in advance the movements of materials and identifying the persons within each facility who could be at risk of an exposure. Next slide. As I mentioned earlier, preliminary work group discussions indicate that a majority of work group members seem to be favoring a shared clinical decision-making recommendation for this population. Their reasoning includes the following. One of the major concerns voiced by the work group is that occupational health programs may require employees to be vaccinated if it is recommended by ACIP and that there could be concerns for unintended negative career consequences for persons who either don't want the vaccine or those with contraindications to vaccination. Additionally, 
state designated ETCs may lend themselves to higher attrition rates because they are not federally funded and can opt out of providing this service at any time. This was related to a general concern for the administration of a large number of vaccines in a population that may be at negligible risk of exposure to Ebola virus. Next slide. Furthermore, the work group members who favored shared clinical decision-making for this population indicated that they believe the risk versus benefit of the vaccine in this population is not as clear as their federally designated counterparts. They noted that the vaccine is efficacious, but not without some expected side effects and risks. Additionally, not all individuals working at, designated, at state designated Ebola treatment centers are at equal risk, and these staff members are trained in proper PPE and biosafety practices, which offer an effective first line of protection. Likely not all personnel in these facilities will want the vaccine, but the vaccine should be available for those that choose to take it. Additionally, personnel duties may change, placing an individual at greater or lesser risk with their assumption of new duties. So given these nuances, it's the feeling of these members of the work group that a blanket recommendation may not be most appropriate for this population. Finally, the work group noted that health insurance coverage is not necessarily a benefit of recommending this vaccine as it is with others, as this vaccine will be made available at no cost through the U.S. government. Next slide. This next section of my presentation will focus on the work group considerations for the expansion of Ebola vaccine recommendations to personnel working in LRN facilities that may receive and handle clinical specimens from suspect Ebola patients for diagnostic testing. Next slide. The work group has discussed two policy options with regards to recommending the Ebola vaccine in personnel working in LRN facilities. Recommend and recommend with shared clinical decision-making. Considerations are ongoing, but preliminary discussions, again, suggest the work group favors shared clinical decision-making with regards to pre-exposure vaccination with the Ebola vaccine in this population. Again, we are looking forward to receiving feedback today from the committee on this issue. Next slide. Work group members who favor recommending the vaccine in this population cited reasons, including that recommending would improve general preparedness of frontline laboratory personnel, as LRN personnel do receive the uninactivated clinical sample from suspect Ebola patients, and it's important to provide LRN personnel the same protections as lab workers that are affiliated with federally designated Ebola treatment centers and BSL-4 facilities for this reason. Next slide. Work group members who favor recommending the vaccine with shared clinical decision-making for LRN personnel cited reasons, including similar to those voiced for the state-designated ETCs, that occupational health programs may require employees to be vaccinated if it's recommended by ACIP, and there may be unintended negative career consequences for persons who either don't want the vaccine or those with contraindications to receiving it. Additionally, and again, Health insurance coverage is not necessarily a benefit of recommending this vaccine as it will be made available at no cost to the U.S. government. Next slide. Finally, these work group members discussed that the risk versus benefit of this vaccine in this population is not as clear. Similar to the concerns voiced for the state-designated Ebola treatment centers, the vaccine is efficacious, but not without some side effects. Not all individuals in a given facility are at equal risk, and not all staff at these facilities will want the vaccine, but it should be made available for those that choose to take it. And finally, that personnel duties may change, placing an individual at greater or lesser risk with their assumption of new duties. So given these nuances, it is the feeling of these members of the work group that a blanket recommendation may not be most appropriate for this population. Next slide. Now I will walk through the specific policy options under consideration and request the committee's feedback on the language and additional considerations. Next slide. The first vaccination policy issue for consideration is, should pre-exposure vaccination with the Ebola vaccine be recommended for individuals 18 years or older 
working as healthcare personnel in state-designated Ebola treatment centers, or should pre-exposure vaccination with the Ebola vaccine be recommended with shared clinical decision-making for individuals in this population? Next slide. Similarly, the second vaccination policy issue for consideration is should pre-exposure vaccination with the Ebola vaccine be recommended for individuals 18 years of age or older working as staff in facilities within the laboratory response network that may handle replication-competent Ebola virus? Or should pre-exposure vaccination with the Ebola virus vaccine be recommended with shared clinical decision-making for individuals in this population? Next slide. As a starting point for discussion, for discussion, we would appreciate the committee's feedback on the following items. What are the perceived advantages and disadvantages of recommending use of the vaccine in these populations? And what are the perceived advantages and disadvantages of recommending with shared clinical decision-making in these populations? Finally, what additional information will be useful for the committee for decision-making in anticipation of a future vote? With that, I'll stop here for any questions or discussions. Thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you very much for that uh, presentation. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, sorry, Ms. McNally, go ahead. Thank you. I really appreciated these two presentations. I thought the survey results and the summary of the work group discussions are just incredibly helpful in thinking about this. So on the risk-benefit analysis, when I think about this for the shared clinical decision-making, in these populations, I was wondering if you could share uh, a little bit more information regarding what that education looks like for the populations regarding susceptibility. Of Sure, this is Caitlin, um, and I'll touch on this very briefly with some um, numbers that we have received from the LRN in, uh, in response to questions regarding um, what their experience has been to date of testing of suspect EDD patients, and then maybe Allison can touch on again what the um, introduction to the survey that provided a little bit of background to the participants that um, completed the surveys in relation to um, Ebola virus disease and their perceived risk. So um, we did do a little bit of digging um, and consulted with the Laboratory Response Network points of contact, and we did learn that since um, the LRN got the ability to test for Ebola virus beginning in 2016, they have received clinical samples from nine suspect EVD patients. Um, among all of the facilities since 2016. Um, in addition to that, as we, um, we are aware of zero suspect EVD patients that have been admitted to state-designated Ebola treatment centers. And with that, Allison, I don't know if you can recap um, the survey and um, the introduction to the survey that um, people uh, on Ebola, that kind of introduced them to Ebola virus disease um, relative to their perceived risk? Sure, so in the beginning of the survey, we did wanna provide people with just some background information um, on the vaccine and what we had found, uh, just to kind of inform their decisions. So in addition to just kind of summarizing the potential arthralgia, arthritis, and transmission of the vaccine virus, we also just uh, gave a quick blurb on the clinical efficacy that was established in an open-label randomized cluster vaccination study, which gave a vaccine efficacy of 100% with a 95% confidence interval from 63.5% to 100%, and just informing them that no cases of confirmed EVD were observed in the immediate vaccination clusters compared to 10 confirmed cases of EVD uh, observed in the total of four delayed vaccination clusters between day 10 and day 31. And then we also informed them that the duration of protection confirmed by the Ebola virus vaccine is unknown at this time. So we didn't give them much information on like their individual risk of 
infection. Uh, and the survey just kind of asked them about their own personal feelings about that without providing um, any background information for them. Does that answer your question? Sorry, I had to get off mute. Yes, it, it does answer my question in terms of what information was provided to those groups at that time. But what about moving forward in the context of that shared clinical decision making uh, decision process? You know, I, I do think that was one of the interesting things that the survey results kind of revealed is that people were very interested in knowing about their perceived risk of infection and the perceived risk of transmitting the vaccine virus and their risk of acquiring a severe adverse event. So, I mean, I don't know that I can speak to what information should be provided, but I think the survey could help inform what information people would be interested in. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for the, the answer there. Thank you. Dr. Dries. Thank you, Marcy Dries with Shea. Um, I have a comment and a, or a question and a comment. Um, my question is, you know, in addition to the 51 Ebola treatment centers that you presented, there are many, many more Ebola assessment centers uh, in each state, including many in states that don't have an Ebola treatment center. Um, and these, these assessment centers are expected to care for an, a, a rule out Ebola patient for up to 96 hours um, while the initial testing is being performed. Was there any discussion about eventually making the vaccine available to those facilities as well, uh, to the frontline staff and laboratorians? Um, and then my, my comment is really just about, um, you know, we rely on volunteers to staff these Ebola assessment centers at least, and I'm sure many of the others as well. Um, and I think having vaccine available uh, could help us recruit additional staff um, in terms of making them comfortable to serve in that setting. Um, but I think requiring it would also potentially turn off other staff and, and prevent them from volunteering. Uh, just because of, of the concerns that you raised about uh, any sort of mandatory vaccine. So um, I think it could it could cut both ways. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Dries. Thank you so much for the comment and also the question. And, um, you know, our, our committee, that echoes the, the concerns that our, our work group um, discussions have entailed in the past months. Um, and regarding your question, question about the Ebola assessment hospitals. Indeed, these are definitely on the, um, the radar of our committee um, or of our work group. Um, we kind of took a tiered approach um, since the vaccine was licensed last year and um, deemed that the three populations for which we, um, that were given the recommendation in 2020 um, were at highest risk um, and then immediately began considering the next tier um, to be the LRNs and state designated Ebola treatment centers. And then as we move forward, um, indeed the, the Ebola um, assessment hospitals, um, you know, will be um, considered by the work group as well. Uh, Thank this you. is uh, Beth Bell. Can I just make a comment, um, Dr. Romero, before we, on this particular topic? Please do, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm as a work group member. I think um, one of the big challenges with the um, state designated Ebola treatment centers, and by extension, an even larger challenge with the assessment hospitals, is that it, there's a huge heterogeneity in terms of what this means. As you'll notice, there were only 18 of those 51 so-called state designated Ebola treatment centers that even responded at all to the survey. And our sense, I mean, despite heroic efforts on the part of the staff to try to actually understand which of these uh, state designated uh, centers actually are active as such, it was almost impossible. Well, it was impossible to determine that. And I think it's an even larger issue with the assessment hospitals where I think, you know, this assessment, this whole infrastructure was kind of put together um, after the 2013 or 2014 to 2016 Ebola outbreak. And then I'm not sure the kind of, the, or let's just say the care of, and feeding of this has been um, very uh, patchy. 
So uh, just to say that if it, I, I think that, in my opinion anyway, one of the major reasons for shared clinical decision making is that we are not dealing with a homogeneous group with clear mandates as we are, for example, with the federally designated uh, treatment centers. And I think that's going to be an even larger issue if we try to tackle or when we try to tackle assessment centers. So any suggestions that you might have um, about this issue certainly would be very helpful. I think we found, you know, there were four or five very active um, state Ebola treatment centers and a large group of silent, unclear if this even exists uh, category of, of uh, facilities. Thank you, Dr. Bell. Dr. Lee. Uh, thank you. I wanted to just comment about the question of shared clinical decision making versus a recommendation. And in this case, to me, um, and I realize, you know, we're still kind of working our way through the different flavors of shared clinical decision making. But to me, this this feels more like a recommendation than shared clinical decision making. Um, in part, uh, my rationale for that being that if the, you know, benefit risk balance is demonstrably in favor of the benefit. Um, then it becomes about a question about what is the risk of the individual in being exposed. Um, but I don't think that necessarily means that we have to move to shared clinical decision making. Um, I do think that in general, I'll state out loud that I think that every decision to vaccinate is a shared clinical decision as we've seen with coronavirus vaccines. And we can make a recommendation to provide clarity in the strength of the benefit risk balance. Um, but in many cases where there's contraindication, we obviously do not require vaccination when it is otherwise contraindicated. Um, and I don't necessarily believe that um, we should take the shared clinical decision-making route because of concerns about mandates. Um, I would you know, state strongly that I feel like we should not necessarily have a mandate around this. I mean, I do think that um, there has to be some discussion about uh, understanding the benefits and the risks um, and recognizing that there's huge heterogeneity and risk, as was mentioned previously, and the ability for PPDE to protect. Um, but I think, you know, if I frame this now post our COVID experience, I don't feel strongly that we have to move to shared clinical decision making because of um, concerns about requirements. Instead, I think we should make a clearer statement in favor of a recommendation um, in this instance, and I would reserve shared clinical decision making for where that benefit risk balance is um, not so clear, which may be in extremely low risk populations, but I think in the, these populations, it's about protecting the workforce. Can I just say one thing, and then I will promise I'll be quiet. Sorry, this is Dr. Bell again. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I, my, my concern um, is that this 51 state designated ETCs runs the gamut from a place where nothing exists, there isn't even such a thing, to a few places where it's actually serious. So I'm concerned about making a recommendation for a population that is actually doesn't, is not necessarily doesn't exist. We can't characterize it. We don't know what it means. And so in that situation, I am, as I say, very concerned about saying we recommended for 51 state designated ETCs when there probably aren't even 51 state designated ETCs. So that I just want to clarify, at least in my view, doesn't have to do with mandates. It has to do with this is a designation that I don't think it actually means anything anymore. I mean, that is super helpful. Uh, sorry, Dr. Romero, I'm just going to respond real quickly. I think um, it is super helpful. And, and I think in that case, and I recognize you stated that it was really challenging to get this data, but I think in that case, it really behooves us to define the population clearly in terms of who is truly at risk. So I think if, you know, of those 51, there are a dozen that really are not functioning in that way. Um, having that clarity up front in the PICO question would be useful. I mean, my assumption is that otherwise the people who would be eligible in the population or the PICO question would truly be, you know, have some risk, whatever that risk may be. Okay, uh, we will move on to the next question. For the new members, we rarely, if ever, um, engage in uh, exchange within the groups um, but uh, I think this is important enough that we um, have this uh, discussed uh, so that we can consider it. So thank you very much for that discussion, Dr. Bell and Dr. Uh, Lee. So uh, Dr. Talbot. I'm actually going to continue their discussion, if that's okay. Um, so a couple things. I am not worried. 
Dr. Talbot, you may need to get closer to your microphone. We can ver- barely hear you and start from the beginning. Again, it, helps, it helps when I move the mic in front of my face and not behind my head. Sorry about that. Um, so I think the first question I have is really for Dr. Cohen regarding Dr. Drury's question. If we recommend something, that is not necessarily mandating. Um, and I think uh, that needs to be clarified. Can Dr. Cohen clarify? And then I can ask my second or make my second comment. Dr. Sanchez? Yes. Wait. Can I speak now? Right. I didn't hear the reply to, um, to Kip's question. Yeah. We're, uh, could, you re- could you repeat the question again, Dr. Talbot? Yeah. Yeah. So for Dr. Cohen, and the question is, when we recommend a vaccine, does that equal a mandate? Because I have never equated a recommendation as a mandate before. And the reason I say that is because we recommended COVID, and by no means did we make that a mandate. So I was hoping she could clarify that confusion. confusion. Thanks. I'm going to let Dr. Wharton, um, who is here on behalf of uh, Dr. Messonnier right now, uh, respond. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thanks for that question. And obviously, ACIP is not in the business of issuing mandates. Um, Those are, um, you know, for... uh, for children, those are uh, established by state governments, sometimes local governments, and within healthcare settings, um, there's there's other groups that do it. So, no, I think that ACIP can make a recommendation, and um, the committee is not issuing a mandate when you make a recommendation. So, along those lines, I think if we believe this vaccine truly is important to protect the healthcare workers, we recommend it, and I think we do. A similar caveat to what we've done for the COVID vaccine, saying there's little experience, hence we're not, we would not recommend, you know, we can add, we would not necessarily mandate with this current lack of data or would want more data before any sense of mandating. I mean, I think that would be fine. And to best comment, if they're unaware that they are a COVID center, then I mean, an Ebola center, they probably won't vaccinate anyone because they're unaware. So we can recommend it. I, um, I don't think it would make any difference in those situations. So, I'm done. Any other comments on that topic? Yes. Go ahead, Dr. Uh, Pablo, uh, Dr. Sanchez. Yeah. No, so I, I essentially wanted to agree with, um, with Grace's comment. I, it seems to me that it should be a recommendation because the disease is significant um, and we should be protecting our, our you know, the laboratory personnel and healthcare workers at any facility. So I think that providing um, guidance on the, on, on the definition of the population at risk and who we're talking and about and who, what kind of centers they are would be important. I want to also echo um, the previous comment that just because we recommended it, it's not mandatory and it's not like somebody's going to get fired because they don't receive the vaccine. Um, and then I saw some other issue about rec- about contraindications. I mean, there's always contraindications in every vac- for every vaccine. And so someone who ha- carries a specific contraindication, obviously, um, there's, you know, can, may choose, may obviously not get vaccinated. So to me, given the severity of the, of the disease and that fact that we have a vaccine with high efficacy, um, it should be a recommendation. And this is Sharon. I also want to weigh in on that. Um, I I was one of those people who chose to recommend over uh, shared decision-making based on the same reason that Dr. Lee suggested that all of these decisions should be shared clinical decisions. Um, To me, this is, a again, I'm just reiterating practically what Grace has already said. This is a very serious disease. And if there's a vaccine available and people want to take it, want, okay, not mandatory, but want to take it, then they should be able to access it. And I don't suggest that it be mandated. It's recommended. And we we had these discussions uh, uh, over the past few years about what is the difference between recommended and shared clinical decision. And 
my understanding of that was uh, similar to what's already been ex ex uh, expressed, um, and this would not um, recommend it recommend recommending still seems like the appropriate thing to me because it is a very serious disease. Thank you. Yeah, hi, uh, this is Mary Choi. Um, I just wanted to clarify something about the survey. Um, we should keep in mind that the survey was sent out to the state designated ETCs and the LRNs um, in the midst of the COVID pandemic. And actually around the time um, that, that COVID vaccine was um, being, uh, you know, evaluated and rolled out. So I don't know that we should interpret uh, the number of facilities that responded to the survey as a clear reflection of their interest in the vaccine. It's just very likely that they were busy. Over. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, Dr. Sanchez, your hand is still up. Did you wish to make an, uh, an additional comment? No, no, no. I, I, okay. no. So I'm just making sure that we're, we're not skipping somebody. Uh, Dr. Bat, uh, sorry, Ms. Bata. Um, it, it would make sense to me to recommend this vaccine because it shows we then are telling those individuals who may be at increased risk of exposure to Ebola that um, the benefit does outweigh the risk. Um, and the other question that I know that we're worried about the um, the mandate, but who will be making that clinical decision with the employee? Will it be the employer? And um, and so I think that um, you could have mandates either way. And um, I think people would be much more assured that the the the, the benefits and the, the safety data, the benefits and the risk, um, compel us to make a recommendation if you're in that situation that you're in. Thank you. Dr. Dries. Thank you. Yes, I just wanted to clarify my earlier statement. I was not trying to suggest that a recommendation by ACIP would mean a mandate by ACIP, but certainly, you know, some health systems have adopted a policy such that any vaccine that is recommended for healthcare personnel by ACIP becomes a, a condition of employment, um, barring you know medical contraindications, et cetera. But um, so I, I just wanted to bring up that there is the possibility for unintended consequences um, based on the recommendation. Now we've made you know we've Shea has recommended an exception to that for you know COVID vaccines, for example, and could certainly do something similar uh, for this vaccine. Thank you, Dr. Bernstein. Uh, yes, I, I I share the the thinking here as people are trying to wrestle between the two ideas. I went back to the CDC definition and it talks about that the key distinction between risk-based recommendations and shared clinical decision-making recommendations is the default decision to vaccinate. For risk-based recommendations, the default decision should be to vaccinate the patient based on age group or other indication and less contraindicated. For shared clinical decision making, there is no default. The decision about whether or not to vaccinate is informed by the best available evidence of who may benefit. And there are so many characteristics that go into the equation. Given that definition that's on the CDC website, I, I think, uh, vaccination uh, recommendation makes more sense because I do think the default decision should be to vaccinate. That doesn't say that it should be the mandate because we don't make recommendations to mandate, but making uh, recommendations to uh, vaccinate makes sense to me. Thank you. Dr. Paling. Uh, yes, thank you. So um, I appreciate this conversation. I also appreciate the clarification of the challenges of the survey response given the COVID distribution time. Um, when I'm thinking about this, I'm trying to understand the difference between the state 
designated Ebola treatment centers and the Ebola assessment centers. And what could you please clarify why those groups are different and how? Dr. Troy? Yeah, hi. Um, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, so I'm going to be a little bit general about this. Um, but basically, um, associated with the 2014 outbreak, and, and Dr. Bell, y you could certainly um, chime in here because obviously you were involved in this process. Um, but basically, they set up a, a tiered system where all hospital, well, all ERs and urgent cares were considered frontline hospitals. And then you had um, assessment hospitals, and they would have the capabilities to take care of an Ebola patient, I believe, for 72 hours. And then the next level um, were the treatment centers. Um, and since then, you know, there is now two levels of treatment centers. One are the state designated treatment centers, and one is the federally designated treatment centers. And as Dr. As uh, Allison um, pointed out, the federally designated treatment centers, except for NIH, are funded by ASPR, uh, and the state designated Ebola treatment centers. Um, our facilities that have come forward and presented them, um, themselves as wanting to be a resource to their community, and that is a decision between the hospital and then the state. Um, but in, in, in a nutshell, the difference is essentially how long each, lo each level, each tier is expected to care for an Ebola patient. Thank you for that information. Are there any other comments or questions from the voting members or liaisons? I, um, I'm not seeing any, so um, um, we're in our final session of the day under hepatitis vaccine. So uh, we'll begin um, and um, we'll turn it over again to Dr. Fry uh, for the introduction as work group chair. Thank you, Dr. Romero. So this is the last introduction for the day, so we'll make this brief. Uh, we are going to be giving you an update on the hepatitis work group activities. Uh, for the last several months, the work group has been considering whether all unvaccinated adults should receive hepatitis B vac vaccination. Okay, <laughs> I was going to say next, but it's already done. All right, uh, today uh, we, uh, Dr. Mark. Wang will present hepatitis background information, and Dr. Eric Hall will present uh, the economic evaluation. In June, we plan to present grade uh, evidence to recommendation framework and HEPASLAV B post marketing surveillance data. In October, uh, we are planning to have an ACIP vote if all goes well. Next, please. So the proposed uh, policy question is, should all unvaccinated adults receive hepatitis B vaccination? And an alternative to this is uh, a PICO question for ACPI committee's consideration. Should all unvaccinated adults age 59 years and under receive hepatitis B vaccination? Next, please. So we have, uh, I would like to just recognize again and thank all the hepatitis work group members. Uh, Kevin Alt is our uh, ACIP member on this uh, committee, and Mark Wang is our CDC lead. He has kept us on task through the COVID pandemic quite nicely. Uh, our ex officio members, liaison, rep liaison representatives and consultants are listed there for you. Next, please. And we would like to acknowledge the various groups that have helped uh, with this committee and our C uh, CDC subject matter experts. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Romero. Thank you. Um, so we'll turn it over to Dr. Wang. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Mark Wang. I'll be giving the background presentation to updating hepatitis B vaccination policy on behalf of the hepatitis work group. The question we're considering is, should all unvaccinated adults receive hepatitis B vaccination?
As a quick refresher, hepatitis B virus is a double-stranded enveloped DNA virus as seen on the right. It causes a disease that's vaccine preventable with vaccines that have a long established record of safety and effectiveness. Hepatitis B infection is a cause of premature death and chronic liver disease, such as from liver cancer or cirrhosis. 15 to 25% of those infected get this. There's in uh, 15 to 40% of infected, um, there are HBV related complications and a not insignificant acute case fatality rate of half a percent to 1%. The World Health Organization and the US Department of Health and Human Services has played a role in setting hepatitis B elimination goals by 2030. And we'll see that there's still a ways to go. This is a chart of hepatitis B virus incidents in the US, where the x-axis is time, 1980 to 2018. The y-axis is the HBV incidence from zero to nearly 300,000 cases. In yellow, we've highlighted the relevant points in time for initiation of adult recommendations. In 1982, vaccination was recommended for people at increased risk. And in 2011, adults aged less than or equal to 59 years with diabetes. The cases of acute hepatitis B declined after routine vaccination of children was recommended in 1991 and became relatively stable from 2010 through 2018. In summary, there's been phenomenal progress in decreasing hepatitis B incidence in the US over the years. But the last mile to achieve further decreases has proven challenging. We won't go into this slide in detail, but it's a reminder that since 1982, the current national Hep B vaccination strategy includes numerous risk factors to assess. This strategy has proven complicated from a clinical and patient perspective, becoming a significant barrier to further public health gains. There's likely under ascertainment and under reporting of hepatitis B. Here are results from a published model to estimate the true incidence of acute hepatitis B as opposed to reported cases. Each reported case of acute hepatitis B represented 6.5 estimated infections. With that under ascertainment noted, this is a graph of reported cases of acute hepatitis B by age group. On the x-axis, we have years from 2003 to 2018. On the y-axis, reported cases per 100,000 population. Notably, in dark red, cases in the age range of 0 to 19 years is lowest, as one might expect with the successes in universal childhood vaccination programs. The impact of universal vaccine recommended since 1991 can also be seen among the 20 to 29 year old group in which rates have been consistently decreasing. This is followed by, in pink, rates that have been steadily low among 60 plus year olds. I'll then note also that represented by the top two green lines, over half of acute hepatitis B cases reported to CDC in 2018 occurred among people aged 30 to 49 years. On the pie chart from the CDC hepatitis surveillance report represented in white, 48% of cases had missing risk factor data, while in lighter green shading, 25% of reported cases had no risk factor identified. So this shows that the majority, nearly three quarters of the reported cases of acute hepatitis B had problematic risk factor assessment, potentially precluding initiation of subsequent hep B vaccination among people with unidentified risks or in other words, missed opportunities to vaccinate. The poor utility of ascertaining risk factor information for vaccination is also reflected in this table of the risk behaviors and exposures in the first column with the status of no risk identified and risk data missing predominating. These groups form a reservoir able to transmit hepatitis B virus to other at-risk individuals and they seek care at later stages of disease. The high level of unawareness of infection status could be explained by both the lack of knowledge in the general population or those at risk and the lightness given by healthcare providers and policymakers regarding the public health impact of hepatitis B infection. In response, the ACIP hepatitis work group has been discussing this proposed policy question. Should all unvaccinated adults receive hepatitis B vaccination? For the PICO question, the population is previously unvaccinated adults 18 years and over. 
The intervention is the universal vaccination strategy, both two and three dose schedules. The comparison is the current risk-based vaccination strategy, two and three dose schedules. The outcomes are vaccine uptake, incidence of hepatitis B, morbidity related to hepatitis B, mortality related to hepatitis B, and serious adverse events related to the two-dose vaccine. This last outcome requires some comment. Here, this outcome solely aimed at assessing the two-dose Heplosav B, approved in 2018, for which a standard post-marketing surveillance study is in progress, and it's to be presented prior to any votes on a proposed policy question. The three-dose Hep B vaccines have already been evaluated for their adverse events profiles and recommended by ACIP based on their safety records. Now we'll drill down to where some of the limitations of Hep B coverage lie under the current policy recommendations. In 2017, the reported Hep B vaccination coverage, this is greater or equal to three doses since it predates the approval of the two-dose vaccine, was overall 25.8% for adults greater or equal to 19 years old. It's similarly low across the risk factors for which this coverage information was collected. On the x-axis are travelers, chronic liver conditions, healthcare personnel, and diabetes. Surprisingly, even among healthcare, healthcare personnel, coverage is still suboptimal at 60 around 60%. In the next two tables, we'll take a deeper dive into where some of the gaps are in U.S. adult Hep B coverage. These are data generated by Walter Williams and colleagues at NCIRD. Please remember that these data were presented to the work group in 2016, which predates the approval of the two-dose vaccine. And so again, that's why the coverage exam is for three or more doses. Among the U.S. born, coverage was statistically higher than that of non-U.S. born for most of the age groups. Coverage was lower for all age groups among the uninsured compared to those with health insurance. Surprisingly, coverage among people aged 19 to 59 years without diabetes was higher than coverage for people aged 19 to 59 years with diabetes. Coverage was similar for people aged greater or equal to 60 years with or without diabetes. Two studies showed the limits of a strategy of using only presence of a risk factor to initiate hepatitis B virus testing. In Germany, of 51 primary care clinics, where over 21,000 patients were tested only if the risk factor were present, they missed 33% of surface antigen positive adults. In a US multicenter perspective study of over 3,000 cancer patients, they found no identifiable risk factors in over 20% of patients with cancer and HBV. Among chronic HBV patients, 40% were newly diagnosed. So I know I've just spoken to you about hepatitis B virus testing in that last slide, and not specifically about Hep B vaccination. The mediocre performance of risk factor assessment is the key point of showing those studies, not the testing per se. The work group did deliberate on the role of hepatitis B virus testing, and recognizes that certain populations may benefit from testing. However, the work group recognized its mandate to primarily address the role of vaccination policy without rolling testing guidelines into a policy decision for an ACIP vote. Meanwhile, the work group understands that hepatitis B virus testing guidelines, such as a universal testing approach, and practical considerations are concurrently being assessed by a parallel advisory group. We do know that we don't want testing to be a barrier to access to vaccination. It should be recognized that risk factors assessed include socio-structural factors that may criminalize and stigmatize. For example, in the ongoing opioid crisis, stigma associated with drug use may keep people from reporting risk factors to their clinicians. Currently, healthcare providers may rely on self-reported vaccine history to determine need for vaccination, but we know that self-reported vaccination history doesn't predict immunity well. The proposed policy recommendation could dramatically reduce stigma among hidden people at increased risk and immigrants with concerns about any stigma associated with hepatitis B virus-related care. Just a reminder of the available Hep B vaccines for Comavax, Indrix, Twinrix, and Heplosav. We won't be considering Pediorix since it's for children. 
As previously reviewed by ACIP, Recombivax, Indirix, Twinrix have well established safety, immunogenicity, and efficacy. Again, the vaccine offers over 90% protection among healthy adults who complete the three-dose series with rare adverse reactions. Immunogenicity lasts at least three decades, and immunocompetent people are protected even if the titers decline to less than 10 MIU per ml. As a reminder of the status of Heplosaf B, which we're referring to here as the two-dose series, Heplosaf B vaccine trials reported a statistically insignificant increase in cardiovascular events compared to Indrix. The post-marketing surveillance study, standard for all new vaccines, is anticipated in 2021 and will be presented to the work group when available. In conclusion, major reductions in hepatitis B cases were achieved with incremental hep B vaccine policy over the past four decades. But recent trends in hepatitis B incidents demonstrates the limit of current risk-based hep B recommendations. The recent CDC surveillance report shows risk factors identified in only a quarter of acute hepatitis B cases. Evidence in the US and Europe highlight that it can be inefficient and ineffective to perform hep B risk factor assessment in clinical settings. A revised policy tool could overcome inherent challenges in ascertaining important risk factors and reducing stigma in clinical settings, promoting health equity. Universal adult vaccination policy could increase adult hep B vaccine coverage and thus could advance towards hepatitis B elimination in the U.S. by 2030. Let me just mention issues that were deliberated on among the work group, which we asked ACIP members to weigh in on after our series of presentations. Throughout the work group discussion, a significant minority of work group members discussed adding the following age qualification to the proposed policy question adults aged 59 years and under. So the alternatively phrased question with the addition highlighted would read, should all unvaccinated adults aged 59 years and under receive hepatitis B vaccination? So the broad questions for ACIP members to consider after these sessions would be as follows. Should hep B vaccination be recommended for all unvaccinated adults? Furthermore, should such a recommendation be limited to adults age 59 years and under? And what other types of evidence are particularly important to the committee that would help with the above questions? Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you for that presentation. Um, next, we'll go on to economic analysis by Dr. Hall. Dr. Hall. Okay, um, thank you, Mark. And so my name is Eric Hall. I am um, with the Department of Epidemiology at Emory University. And today I'll be presenting this economic evaluation of universal hepatitis B vaccination among adults. And this is work that I did with colleagues both at Emory um, and Eli Rosenberg and others at the School of Public Health at University of Albany. Next slide, please. And just a quick note that none of the authors have any conflicts of interest. Next slide. And so the study question of this analysis was to evaluate the cost effectiveness of a universal hepatitis B vaccination recommendation for all adults 19 years of age or older. And before going into this specific study question, I wanted to quickly outline the general approach for this type of economic analysis by highlighting three important steps. So the first step is to define the strategies that will be compared. And in this presentation, I'll be talking about two types of strategies. The baseline strategy, which is our current status quo or comparison strategy, and then the alternate strategy, which are the interventions being evaluated. To compare the two types of strategies, we first define a base case scenario that serves as the primary result of the analysis. And while we know that several of the model inputs have uncertainty, the base case uses the point estimates or the values that we feel most confident in for the, in those inputs. Um, and then base case results also are the primary results that serve as the anchor to which we will compare sensitivity analysis results. Uh, which brings me to the third step of this approach, which are those sensitive analyses that aim to evaluate the impact of uncertainty or general assumptions on model results. And as you will see, uh, we conducted a variety of types of sensitive analyses in this work. Next slide, please. 
So again, the study question we're evaluating here um, is the cost effectiveness of universal hepatitis B vaccination recommendation for adults age 19 years of age and older. So the baseline comparison strategy um, is current existing hepatitis B vaccination recommendations with a three dose vaccine series. And then we considered two alternate intervention strategies. The first being universal adult vaccination um, with a three dose series. And then the second being a universal adult vaccination recommendation with a two dose series. Next slide. To further define those alternate strategies, uh, we primarily focused on evaluating the initiation of hepatitis B vaccination among adults that are not currently recommended to receive vaccination. So as Mark previously mentioned, under current recommendations, persons deemed at high risk of HBV infection um, are currently recommended to receive vaccination. And in the base case analyses, we assume that this intervention and potential policy change only applies to individuals that are not um, high risk. And we assume that there would not be an increase in vaccination coverage among those high risk persons. So as you will see, we relaxed this assumption in sensitive analyses. And then again, and additionally, because the intervention that we're evaluating does not include pre-vaccination testing for non-high-risk persons, we model the unnecessary vaccination of persons that are infected and unaware of their infection, um, or persons that forgot they were previously vaccinated. And then finally, we assume all vaccination takes place at a single point in time. Thanks. Um, we evaluated the study question using a decision tree model with the Markov disease progression process. We simulated 1 million micro simulation trials with single year age heterogeneity, representative of the US adult population, and modeled two different groups, non-high risk persons or our general population and high risk persons. On the right, you see the part of the decision tree model that represents the baseline strategy of current recommendations. The key piece here is that you can see the two population groups are explicitly modeled and that we're including um, current levels of vaccination coverage and existing hepatitis B infections. Next slide. Here's the section of the tree that represents the primary intervention of interest. Um, this, is the, this is the portion of the model that represents non-high risk persons seeking hepatitis B vaccination in the alternate strategy. So here you can see that we are allowing for the necessary vaccination of persons that were previously infected and unaware of their infection or persons that were previously vaccinated and forgot they're vaccinated. Next slide. So after the vaccination process, each individual trial results in being susceptible to infection or protected against infection and then enters the respective Markov process. For those that are susceptible, they enter a Markov process based on a previously published CDC model that models hepatitis B infection and states of disease progression. Each of the boxes represent a health state that an individual trial can enter for one time step or a year. And then at the end of that year, they have an associated probability with transition into the next health state. Each one of these health states also include probabilities associated with dying either from regular hepatitis B background regular background mortality or hepatitis B infection related causes. And then additionally, each health state has an annual cost of the medical management of disease associated with it and the utility value, which is the quantitative measurement used in our calculation of quality adjusted life years. Next slide. To highlight a few more key analytic notes, the analytic horizon is the lifetime of the cohort. Costs are in 2019 US dollars and all costs and qualities are discounted at 3% per year. Our model estimates a variety of health outcomes, including quality adjusted life years, person years, incident infections, and deaths related to hepatitis B infection, as well as the number of vaccine doses administered and persons protected against infection. The primary summary measure of interest is the incremental cost effectiveness ratio. Um, thank you. Here are some of the key vaccination epidemiologic inputs for the baseline strategy. Considering the baseline strategy aims to represent current levels of vaccination coverage, we included data from the National Health Interview Survey for adults 30 plus years of age and data from the National Immunization Survey for adults and younger than 30 years of age. 
Considering universal infant vaccination did not become a recommendation until 1991, we assume all persons greater than 30 years of age that are vaccinated are part of the high-risk group of adults that are currently recommended to receive vaccination. Next slide. Here's a list of costs associated with the administration of each vaccine dose, in addition to different costs for the two-dose and three-dose vaccine series. Um, we also included dose and age group-specific efficacy inputs for each vaccine series. And then additionally, we modeled the dropout between doses based on a cohort study that estimated adult vaccination completion rates, um, and those were actually reported on the previous slide. Next slide. So the intervention in our base case analyses assumed 50% of non-high-risk persons or the general population adults initiated hepatitis B vaccination and that there was no additional vaccination among high-risk persons. However, we also conducted a variety of sensitivity analyses to evaluate input uncertainty and model assumptions. Um, some of the analyses we conducted include an, an interval sensitivity analysis on vaccination coverage in the intervention strategies. Um, we conducted one-way sensitivity analyses on all individual inputs and groups of inputs. We assigned a distribution around each input and conducted probabilistic sensitivity analyses that drew values from each distribution simultaneously. And then we conducted additional scenario analyses in which we looked at different levels of vaccination coverage and inputs for risk of infection. Some of these sensitive analyses won't be presented in this presentation, but are available in the full report. Next slide. To get into some results, here are the point estimates from the primary base case analysis. Results from the three-dose intervention strategy are on the left, and results from the two-dose intervention strategy are on the right. Um, as you will see, the results from each strategy are very similar, with both strategies averting slightly less than a quarter of all new hepatitis B infections, and about 22% of hepatitis B-related deaths. Um, the incremental cost-effectiveness ratio, or the ICER, for the three-dose strategy was about 152,000, and the ICER for the two-dose strategy was about 155,000. Next slide. On this slide, we have base case results of intermediate outcomes scaled up to the U.S. adult population size. So in the first numeric column on the left, I'm reporting the estimated number of intermediate outcomes under the current baseline strategy. And then the two columns on the right report the estimated number of intermediate outcomes in each intervention strategy over the lifetime of the initial cohort. And so just to note, uh, the average number of person years for each trial was about 35 years. Next slide. In conversations leading up to this presentation, the um, viral hepatitis working group specifically requested base case results stratified by age group, which are presented here. Um, to orient you to this table, the three-dose intervention strategy is now on the top half, and the two-dose intervention strategy is on the bottom half. Um, in the three columns on the far right, we reported the percent of acute HPV infections averted, the number needed to vaccinate to prevent an acute infection, and the ICER for each age group. As you will see in both strategies, the ICER is lowest among persons aged 30 to 39 and 40 to 49, and then gets much larger in the older age groups. Next slide, please. Um, on this slide, I have results from one of the key sensitivity analyses in which we allow additional vaccination to occur among high-risk persons as an indirect um, result of a universal vaccination recommendation for the general population. So once again, results from the three-dose alternate strategy are on the top half of this slide, and then results from the two-dose alternate strategy are on the bottom half. In the two columns, I have the same base case results that you have already seen, and then results for a scenario that allows an additional 20% of previously unvaccinated high-risk persons to be vaccinated. Uh, while there is not a specific source for the numeric value of this assumption, conversations with the working group conclude this amount of additional vaccination would be plausible. And comparing the middle column to the right column, we see that as vaccination among high-risk persons also increases, uh, health outcomes improve, and the intervention becomes more cost-effective. Next slide. 
Now, finally, here's a figure that looks at the cost effectiveness of the three dose intervention strategy with different coverage assumptions in the alternate strategy and different assumptions about risk of infection. The Y axis reports the resulting ICER and the three lines represent three different vaccination coverage scenarios defined to the right of the slide. To estimate risk of infection in this model, we started with age-specific reported acute HPV incidence rates from the DVH surveillance report, and then scaled those up based on a commonly used underreporting factor. The x-axis of this figure is the resulting HPV incidence rates that are a result of different combinations of plausible values for both the reported acute HPV incidence and that underreporting correction factor. The key message from this figure is that as the risk of infection increases to the right, the result in ICER decreases. Additionally, as one would expect, higher levels of vaccination coverage in the favorable scenario result in lower ICERs compared to the base case or unfavorable coverage scenarios. And then additionally, we see that um, the uncertainty around risk of infection inputs leads to uncertainty around benefits, particularly at very low levels of disease incidence. Next slide. And this slide is the um, comparable figure for the two-dose intervention strategy in which we see very similar patterns. As the risk of infection increases from left to right, the result in ICER decreases. And then again, additionally, higher levels of vaccination coverage yield lower ICER values, um, particularly at lower levels of assumed acute HPV incidence rates. Next slide. And so to summarize, I pulled out some of the key results under the base case assumption of 50% vaccination initiation among the general population, the three-dose strategy resulted in ICER of about 152,000 and averted almost a quarter of new uh, acute hepatitis B infections. Similarly, the two-dose strategy resulted in ICER of about 155,000 and averted a similar number of infections. When we allowed for additional vaccination of high-risk persons as a result of this policy change, um, we saw greater health benefits. Next slide. And then to wrap up with just a few limitations of this model, um, we use the static model that assumes risk of infection estimates do not change over time. So this indicates we did not include indirect effects of vaccination, indicating our results are a conservative estimate of these effects. Um, we assume vaccination occurred at a single point in time, protection was instantaneously effective, and then protection did not wane. We did not model co-infections. Um, such as HIV or hepatitis C. And then we only assess vaccination strategies in the absence of alternate screening or linkage to care programs, um, which could be a possible underestimate of those costs. Um, and with that, I'll wrap up and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for that excellent presentation. So the presentations by Dr. Ruth Wang and Hall are, are open for discussion or questions. Dr. Talbot. Yes, I was wondering about the comment about limiting to those less than 60 years of age. Um, I, I, acute hep B can still cause significant disease and adults over 60 years of age are Still rather young and active, so I was wondering what the thought was and why they would not be included in this. Hey, this is Mark Wang, um, and others may want to comment as well. But one of the um, main reasons was looking at the economic evaluation that Dr. Hall just presented. Um, it's related to the Differences in incidence when we stratify by age group. Dr. Bata, I'm sorry, Ms. Bata. Oh, it's hard to find my unmute button. Um, I think I need some more information about um, why you chose to assume that the intervention only applies to non-high risk persons when we just heard from Dr. Wang that um, we've done a really poor job of identifying high-risk individuals. Yeah, and that's a great point and great question and something that um, we talked a lot about um, 
kind of been the lead up to this. And um, I don't know if Andrew Leitner is on the line if he wants to comment, but we basically decided to, um, for the primary analysis, focus on what would be like technically the policy change and who it would apply to. And so the policy of change um, technically would exist on top of those other currently existing recommendations for high risk persons to be vaccinated. Um, what I will say is, so I presented results of that sensitivity analysis in which we allowed 20% um, of high risk persons to um, be vaccinated as a result of this policy change. We also extended out that sensitivity analysis even more. Um, so if we want to flip to what looks like slide 33 on here, um, it shows some additional results of if that, if that 20% were higher, basically if 30%, 40%, 50% of high-risk persons also um, ended up getting hepatitis B vaccination as a result of this policy change. Uh, we have some cost effectiveness results from that. Dr. Alt. I asked the same thing uh, about that Dr. Talbot asked uh, during the working group sessions and uh, at it bears repeating, or I'll just repeat it anyway, that uh, it does, the 30 to 60 group has a much higher rate of incident disease than the over 60 group. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sanchez. Thanks, Jose. No, I just wanted just a comment. It seems to me that that it, it only makes sense to, to recommend it I mean, we. I mean, hepatitis B vaccine is safe. It's, you know, it's it's immunogenic, and we know at least, and you know, Dr. All can comment. We know that at least in pregnant women, 50% of them have no risk factors, and yet they're positive. And you know, they're Hep B surface antigen positive. So I would be very much in agreement with um, with the recommendation. Thank you, Dr. Paling. Yes, this is Kathy Paling, and so I'm wanting to draw on some of the experience we've had in children's vaccines with influenza having gone from only high-risk recommendation to now a universal. And when you had an only high-risk recommendation, there was less than 10% of high-risk that were getting vaccinated. And the increase in the high-risk coverage is much higher than 20%. And so I do believe that we should be, I, I'm looking forward to seeing the slide of increasing the high risk um, because I do think um, this is quite a conservative analysis. Um, and then the second thing is, if I'm understanding correctly, as you get older, you're having more people that are going to hit the high risk conditions. And so um, with that, it does make sense to really think should we be recommending across all ages? Thank you for those comments. Dr. Talbot. Dr. Lee. Thank you. Um, thanks for the clear presentation. And I just had two questions. Um, one, I wanted to reiterate the comment about the rationale for um, broader vaccination to me would be to enhance the reliability and consistency of vaccination and that it would improve vaccination rates in both um, high risk and non high risk populations. So it seems to me it's conservative to make an assumption that there would be no improvement in the high risk vaccination rate. And I'm assuming some of the benefit from, benefit from the non-high risk is because we don't always recognize who's at high risk for infection. Um, so it would just be good to understand explicitly whether that was incorporated into the non-high risk population or the high risk population. Um, and then the second question I had was really related to, or comment I had was around the percent completion for a three dose versus two dose series. I, it was, seems to me you assumed it was 100% for both. Um, but I do wonder, um, especially with the adult populations, how often they will come back for their vaccine doses, um, given that uh, we are not always as consistent about um, being our health care provider uh, in, in those middle age groups. Um, and sorry, and then one third, one final uh, comment is just um, 
you know, thinking about benefit risk balance and whether or not any other safety considerations were incorporated. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so those are several good questions and it looks like we have the slides up now for um, the additional side. So if we could flip ahead, um, maybe, I don't know, a handful of slides up to number 33 on my slide set. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight slides ahead. Um, that next one, yeah, that one, perfect. So this is what I um, previously mentioned, and I, I, again, in our conversations, we talked a lot about how um, a lot of the motivation evaluating, of evaluating this question um, or this recommendation would be, as has been mentioned several times, to kind of provide that blanket recommendation that would hopefully try to capture more at high-risk people as well. Um, however, through the, I don't know, I guess the the processes of how we approached this question, um, and again, I'm not sure if Andy's on here and he wants to speak on it, we framed the initial baseline results or base case results as a conservative approach of just um, evaluating only the explicit policy change. But here on this slide, we have some results for relaxing that assumption um, and allowing the vaccination coverage or the vaccination initiation to increase among the non-high risks as well. So moving from left to right across the slide, that's a higher proportion of high-risk persons um, getting vaccinated as a result of this policy change. So that was one thing. Um, the other, the second question was about um, completion rates for the two-dose and three-dose series. Um, and we didn't assume the same completion for both. We, so when I presented kind of our base case analysis of 50% vaccination among the general population, that's 50% vaccination initiation. So half of our general population starting the vaccination series. And then we included dropout between dose one and dose two, and then dose two and dose three when that's applicable. Um, and those dropout rates came from a cohort study that I mentioned, and they're reported at the bottom of slide 10 on that methods input slide. Um, but roughly it's, you know, 20-ish percent of people drop out between each dose. So it yields a much lower number than 50% at the end that actually complete the series. And then we have um, vaccine efficacy inputs for one dose, two dose, or three dose, depending on what the series is. Thank you. Dr. Talbot? Yeah, I'm sorry. Did you hear me before or was I talking to myself? Um, I, I think you might have had your mic misplaced again, but now we can hear you fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Technical difficulties. Um, I was just going to really reiterate what Kathy Paling said. Um, there are a lot of older adults with high-risk conditions. Um, and this would greatly increase the vaccination rate in those just like um, universal flu did in children. But I also want to point out that the earlier we vaccinate our older adults who then develop comorbid conditions such as renal failure, the better their immune response will be. If we wait till they're on hemodialysis, we lose a lot of the potential benefits of the vaccine. So I just don't, uh, I really would, I know the cost will be a little bit more, but I think the benefit will be great if we include those that are over 60 in this blanket recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Daly. Um, yeah, thanks. I have a, a comment and then a question. My, my, my comment is that uh, we did a national survey of physicians about 10 years ago or more with colleagues from NCIRD, and what we found was that primary care physicians, this is going to come as no surprise, but this is internists and family medicine physicians. They basically said, most most TCP said they don't screen for hep B risk factors because it takes too much time. They may, they may screen for individual factors for other reasons, but really they just felt like they didn't have the time. And so then that, they viewed a risk-based strategy as sort of um, uh, hard to implement and presented a barrier to hep B vaccination. So, so I'm certainly in in favor of this strategy, but I'm having trouble thinking about what to do with the folks over 60 for the reasons that, that Kip raised, that Dr. Talbot raised. So 
Um, I recognize that uh, additional chronic conditions occur in that age group, but but I wonder if we could look at what's the incidence of Hep B in that group over age over age sixty. Um, that would that would help me because that's a piece that I'm struggling with here. It looks like they're pulling that up right now. Okay, thanks. I'm sorry. And just to add a little additional, this is their call, um, additional context to this discussion. So we, again, one of the limitations of this model is we didn't uh, model other, you know, chronic conditions that might be more prevalent among people that are over 60. Um, we modeled like the shorter expected year of life, um, but not necessarily other comorbidities that might be occurring. Hey, this is Mark Wang. Uh, just to uh, pull up the slide um, that shows the reported acute hepatitis B by age group, um, and it's the the um, the kind of pinkish line, second from the bottom, uh, the 60 plus year old uh, incidence um, that really is driving the differences in ICER seen in in Dr. Hall's presentation. Um, I don't know if that helps anyone. I'll pause there. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for pulling pulling that up. Thank you, um, Dr. Alt. Please. I I have another comment and or question. Do do we have data about whether people over sixty are better at at adult immunization than people under sixty? I mean, that might be something that would sway people's minds if you're more likely to get. You know, vaccinated appropriately over age 60, then there might be a catch-up period there if we wanted to go higher in the age range. I don't know if that data exists or not, though. This is Mark again. Uh, this, these next two slides are um, maybe closer to um, what you're getting at that we have at the moment. So that's coverage. We can try to look at um, um, uptake and acceptance in the different age brackets going forward. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lee. Uh, thanks. I just uh, had another question, but actually to follow up on Dr. Alt's question, I thought the question you were trying to ask, Kevin, was um, is access to healthcare sort of just more efficient in the over 60 age group? So uh, are we missing opportunities to vaccinate because they might be going in to see their physician more often? So I think it's less about the Hep B coverage specifically and more about adult vaccination coverage and where we get the you know biggest gains. Um, so not um, removing access at a time when uh, they might otherwise be going in and seeing the physician. Um, the question I actually had was related to pregnancy. Uh, we don't have that many vaccines that are recommended across that broad age group unless there's a specific indication um, or contraindication. So I, my question was really about if, if this were to become a broad recommendation, would there be any discussion around pregnant women? Uh, this is Sharon, and we're, we're looking for um, things that people want more information on. So we could put that on the list. Thank you. This is Mark again. Um, I just wanted to um, add that the did come up in the workgroup discussion early on, and it was pointed out that for everyone currently aged 38 years and under, uh, they should already be covered under um, either routine childhood vaccination or catch-up vac recommendation. So that that point was brought up, um, but uh, pregnancy is certainly um, a population of interest for this. Thank you. Dr. Gluckman. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Bob Gluckman from uh, I just wanted to refer the uh, group back to the, um, the slide 15 in the presentation, because I know that there's been some debate here about uh, universal regardless of age. And um, I know that, you know, generally, uh, ASIP is trying to uh, make independent decisions about effectiveness versus cost. but the um, um, incremental cost 
per quality for uh, uh, folks under 60 is over $500,000 per quality adjusted life year. And I think that, you know, given the mandates that we follow with ASIP recommendations, uh, I do think that we, we do need to consider what's the magnitude of benefit for the population has been pointed out. The infection rate is relative, is, is lower. The opportunity to avert some of the complications is going to be less because of other just life expectancy. And, um, you know, we're struggling as a country with with how we how we manage all the demands uh, that we can. So I, I just wanted to refer people back to that slide so that they had some perspective. Thank you, Dr. Paley. Um, yes, thank you. So two things: one on the slide with the um, incidence of hepatitis B by age group. It looked like it, there was a slight increase in the incidence beginning in the year 2012 for the adults 60 years of age and older. Um, is that a correct assessment? This is Mark. Sorry, it took me a while to get back to the slide. Um, you're saying in 2012 there was a... Um, is when it, it looks like that was the nadir, the lowest, and then it's slowly been increasing. Okay, for which, then. sorry, for which age? Are you talking about the top two age groups? 60 years and older. 60 years, oh, thank you. Um, I seem to recall that, uh, and, and maybe Sharon, you can help me out here. I seem to recall that that, that was um, noted in one of the work group calls as well, and it was kind of unclear as whether that would would just be kind of a blip or an artifact, um, or whether that was truly significant. Okay. All right. That helps. Now, the second question I have is for people who have the high-risk condition, we're recommending the vaccine, right? And so, and that's not changing if you say you have a cutoff at 60, but the question is how many people 60 years and older are going to develop those um, conditions and would all would at that point become um, recommended to get the vaccine to get to Kip's point of how many people are going to end up in that category anyway is one of the things in the future I'd be very interested in seeing. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions? Thank you both Dr. Wang and Dr. Uh, Hall for uh, answering those questions and going through your slides again. Um, I think that brings us to the end of our presentations for today. Let me turn it back over to Dr. Cohn for uh, comments. Um, just want to thank everybody for their um, attention uh, today and we are starting again at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, which I will remind you is 6.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, uh, we're very uh, uh, biased uh, with ACIP. Uh, but um, thank you all, and um, we look forward to talking to you tomorrow.